The preparation of the patient is a very important phase because on basis of the care with which we apply the markers on the patient, we will read more or less accurate data in the clinical report. During this lesson, I try to give you all the useful advices in order to make the marker's placement absolutely precise. The walking protocol that we are using is the Davis protocol that employs 22 markers to be placed in some right points of the patient body. The patient has to be undressed so that the body sections on which we are applying the markers are well visible and uncovered. The markers should be integral to the subject as much as possible so that they can follow completely his movement. Before starting with the real preparation phase, it's necessary to take some anthropometric measures of the patient that will be used to define the joint centers of rotation during the processing phase. We start from the markers that are external points to arrive at the joint centers of rotation that are internal points. The anthropometric measures are the weight and the height of the subject, the pelvis width, the pelvis depth for both sides, the diameter of both knees, the diameter of both ankles, the length of both lower limbs. The tools we need for the measures are a pelvimeter, a meter, and two rulers. The patient is asked to lie down on the bed in the supine position. The subject weight and height are measured in the standard way. For the other measures at first, let's check if the patient is placed rightly on the bed with her pelvis well aligned. To measure the pelvis width, we have to identify the anterior superior iliac spines. If you prefer, you can mark the points by a demographic pencil. Keeping the pelvimeter in your hands in this mode, let's lean on the two small knobs softly on the two points and read the measure using the superior scale of the pelvimeter that is expressed in centimeters. Don't make confusion reading the scale below because it is expressed in inch. Now I show you how to measure the knee and the ankle diameter because I still need the pelvimeter. For my convenience, I prefer to take all the measures for which I need the same tool. For the measure of the knee diameter, it's necessary to identify the lateral and medial epicondyle. If you move the knee in flexion, you should find the identification simpler. Keeping the pelvimeter in your hands in the same way, lean on the two small knobs softly on the two points and read the measure. Repeat the same procedure for the ankle. The diameter is assessed between the two apexes of the lateral and medial malleolus. The measures with the pelvimeter are finished. Now let's go to assess the pelvis height that is the most delicate measure. At first we have to identify the great trochanter. To make simpler the identification of this point, we can move the hip in maximum flexion and in intra-rotation. The most protuberant point that you touch under your fingers is the great trochanter. Now you have to bring back down the leg so that it's perfectly aligned, but don't lose the point that you have just identified. For your convenience, you can mark the point with the pencil. Now, using the longer ruler, you have to identify the plane through the great trochanter parallel to the bed. 
With the other shorter ruler, you can measure the distance from the anterior superior iliac spine to this plane. The zero of the vertical ruler should be exactly at the same height of the horizontal ruler. Don't make the mistake of assessing the pelvis height with the pelvimeter between the anterior superior iliac spine and the great tocranter because it would not be the measure of the orthogonal segment. To make you better understand the meaning of the pelvis height, you have to image two planes, one through the great trochanter and one placed on the iliac spine, and measure the distance between these two planes. On basis of all the evaluations made in the time, I can confirm you that there is a strong relationship between the pelvis height and the ankle diameter. I mean that these two measures are more or less equal. So, because you have already measured the ankle diameter, you have to verify that the pelvis height doesn't differ more than 2 cm. If it's so, I suggest to repeat the measure. Finally, let's go to measure the total leg length with the meter from the iliac spine to the medial malleolus through the knee. In case of the patient has the knee blocked in flexion, the measure has to be splitted from the iliac spine to the medial femoral epicondyle and from this point to the medial malleolus. Now we are ready to start with the placement of the markers. The preparation has to be performed with the patient in standing position. You don't have ever to apply the markers on one side before and on the other side later, but you have to apply them in a symmetric way, one on the right and one on the left, from the distal point that is the lowest one up to the proximal point that is the highest one. The operator must be only one person, I suggest to sit down in front of the patient. For me, it's more comfortable. It's important to have already prepared the markers with the tape under the black base of the small support. Pay attention, if you have the support with a long pin, you have to cut it so that the marker is perfectly attached to the base. Let's start with the application of the marker on the five metatarsus. One marker on the right and one marker on the left. Now apply the marker on the heel, paying attention that it's aligned to the marker of the five metatarsus that you have just applied. Looking at the foot from the lateral point of view, the connecting line of these two markers has to be parallel to the foot plantar surface. If the patient has the foot in the supine position, you can move the marker from the five metatarsus to the second metatarsus but also the position of the marker on the heel has to be modified. You have to place it higher in order to respect the alignment with the foot plantar surface. Now apply one marker on the lateral malleolus, one on the right and one on the left, of course. Now apply one marker on the head of the fibula, for the identification of this landmark, you can move your hand laterally along the leg, starting from the malleolus. Press lightly the skin. The first protuberant point that you find is the head of the fibula. Let's go now to apply the marker on the lateral femur epicondyle. I suggest to grab the knee in this way. Place the third finger of your hand on the lateral epicondyle and the first finger on the medial epicondyle. 
the patient is asked to move the knee slowly in flexion and in extension. In the meantime, the clinician has to adjust the position of the fingers till he is able to detect the movement of the bone. Stop the knee in the mean flex position and apply the marker on the epicondyle. Now, apply the marker on the great trochanter. I suggest to hold two markers ready in your hands. Ask the patient if he can, of course, to simulate the movement like he has to put out a cigarette with the foot toy. In this way, you should detect better the movement of the great trochanter. The great trochanter has an extended area. The marker has to be placed in the middle. Let's go to apply the markers on the pelvis. I still suggest to hold two markers ready in your hands and apply them on the right and left iliac spine at the same time. Now we have to apply the marker on the sacrum. First of all, it's very important to clarify that the real position of this marker is on S1, even if the name of the marker is sacrum. Let's start to identify the two visible iliac dimples and place the marker in the middle. Because the iliac dimple has an extended area, you could apply the marker more above or further down. For the exact identification of this landmark, you have to look at the patient from the lateral point of view. If the line between the marker of the sacrum, just identified, and the marker of the anterior superior iliac spine is perfectly perpendicular to the axis of the lumbar trunk, the point on the sacrum is correct. In order to be clearer, you have to image the lower part of the trunk has a cylinder. The axis of this cylinder and the line between the sacrum and the iliac spine should be perpendicular. Now, let's go to apply the markers on the shoulders. Two markers have to be placed on the acromion and one on C7. If you ask the patient to flex the head, the most protuberant point is C7. Finally, we have to place the bars, one on the thigh and one on the leg. It's very important to place these bars with the greatest precision. The bar on the thigh has to be parallel to the axis through the medial and the lateral epicondyles of the femur. These axes and the line connecting the knee and the hip centers of rotation are used by the Davis protocol to define the frontal plane of the thigh. But starting with the assumption that the marker on the femur epicondyle has been applied correctly so that it belongs to the knee flex extension axis, you have to verify only if the marker of the bar is perfectly aligned to the markers of the great trochanter and the femur epicondyle. I suggest also to tighten up the elastic band in order to reduce the movement of the bar due to the sliding of the skin during walking. Repeat exactly the same procedure for the leg.